Dr. T.L. Osborne of Tulsa, Oklahoma, now continues the recording of his special audio book, Soul Winning, Contemporary Witnessing. Christians who are becoming aware of these principles are recapturing the zeal and passion of the early church and they're sharing the good news of Christ Jesus with others. Did you know that the Jehovah's Witnesses have added more converts to their membership during this century than any religious body? While traditional churches were losing members, they were winning. Why? One simple reason. From their inception, they exploited the most strategic secret of the early church and encouraged every convert to be a door-to-door -door witness. While traditional Christians were using their church pews, the Jehovah's Witnesses were using their shoe soles. While church members beat a path to the sanctuary, the Jehovah's Witnesses beat a path to the people. And there they made their converts. When they meet in their kingdom halls, it's not to win converts. It's a meeting of those that they've already won, they've already converted. There they gather to be instructed in witnessing. They master their doctrines and they're trained to be witnesses. When they get ready to make converts, they go out to the streets carrying a tape or cassette player and loaded with attractive literature. They systematically work each section of the town, street by street, knocking on doors, entering homes, witnessing and winning out where the people are. In Christianity Today, one writer said, However one may disagree with the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, we must admire the dedication and sense of mission that takes them from door to door in the face of ridicule and abuse. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses succeed because they stay at it. They work at it. They do it. A hungry world. People are bewildered and confused about spiritual values. They are lost and they search for direction. But they don't trust the church for guidance. Too often, they've not received a true witness of the gospel at the church. They're streaming to the psychologists and the psychiatrists. They're the human guinea pigs for every new theory that's conceived by the growing wave of psychoanalysts. Children are confused. Teenagers are adrift. Parents are bickering. Insecurity and dismay dominate the home. Drinking and perversion are substituted for stability in family life. Sickness, disease, mental stress, and spiritual emptiness go unattended. Wretched existences constitute the lifestyle behind the doors of many of the affluent appearing houses. Through those doors is an open world of ministry for Christians, but millions of church members have never approached them. We pray for people to be saved. It sounds very holy and very pious. Jesus said, go out there and get them. They'll be lost while we pray. Christ can only speak to them through us. We are his legs, his voice, his hands, his body. Today is the opportunity for Holy Spirit-filled specialists in soul winning. Tradition has taught us that evangelists are the soul winners but that everyone else ministers to those who are already saved. First, a Christian. A pastor said, Oh, I'm not a soul winner. I never could deal with non-Christians. My calling is to pastor, to shepherd the flock. Who was the greatest shepherd? Wasn't it Jesus Christ? And he was also the greatest soul winner. If I were a pastor, I would want to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Another person said to me, oh no, I don't make public invitations for people to accept Christ. That's not my calling. My gift, you see, is to teach. Who was the greatest teacher? It was Jesus Christ, wasn't it? And he was also the world's greatest soul winner. If I were a teacher, I'd want to follow Jesus Christ's example of teaching in a way that I would convince people about Jesus Christ. I'm a soul winner because Jesus was. A preacher said to me, oh, reaching the unconverted is not my calling at all. My gift, you see, is to teach prophecy. Well, who was the greatest prophet? Wasn't it Jesus Christ? And he was a soul winner. A minister friend dared to say, I teach types and shadows from the Old Testament. I'm not a soul winner. I minister to the church. Well, who did that better than Jesus? 
yet he won souls when he taught. What I am saying is this. Before you were a pastor, you were a Christian, Christ-like. First, you're called as a Christian to win souls. Then, you may be called to pastor or shepherd a flock. Every pastor can be a soul winner because that's what a Christian is, like Christ. And Jesus Christ was a soul winner. Before you were a teacher, you were a Christian. You have a call as a Christian to witness to be a soul winner. After that, you may be gifted as a teacher to teach Christians. Before you were gifted to preach or teach prophecy in the church, you were a Christian. As a Christian, your first call is to win souls. And your second call or supplementary call or subsequent call may be to prophesy. But here's the rule that I think we should follow. First, a Christian, a soul winner. Then, a pastor. First, a Christian, a soul winner. Then, okay, a teacher. First, a Christian, a soul winner. Then, okay, a musician, a singer, a prophecy teacher, or whatever your gift may be. But it's always first a Christian, a soul winner. Three witnesses. Soul winning first. This is the principle in the kingdom of God. I'll share with you three proofs, three witnesses of this fact from Luke chapter 15 verses 1 to 10. Witness number one. Verse 7. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. You see, heaven rejoices when someone lost is found. One person who is one is a greater delight to heaven than 99 saved people. In the kingdom of God, the priority is on the one who is lost. Witness number two. In the kingdom of heaven, the good shepherd is pictured leaving the 99 in the fold and going out into the mountains, out to the dangerous places, out in the world to seek out the lost sheep. That's in verse 4. The good shepherd is not represented as staying in the fold, caring for the flock, but as going out after the lost one. He does that through us today. As I said, this is a principle in the kingdom of God. Soul winning, seeking out the lost person, comes first. That's God's first priority. Witness number three. The good woman of the house is not pictured by the master as sitting in her chair, counting and carefully polishing her treasured coins. But rather, she's occupied day and night, diligently seeking till she finds the lost coin. That's in verse 8. She lights her candle. She searches patiently in the dark corners until she finds the lost coin. Then she rejoices. If the lost coin represents the unconverted, the scene is very different today. Sunday morning, the pastor polishes the coins which are safe in the fold, the church members. During the week, they are polished again. The lost coins are never sought after. Sunday after Sunday, there's more polishing of the coins which are already in the fold. Week after week, more ministry is directed to the already saved ones. A teacher arrives who's gifted to expound the word of God to Christians. Then the polishing is repeated every night during a series of meetings. Still, there's no ministry to the non-Christians. Then a prophecy preacher arrives. Still, no attention is given to the unconverted. Someone holds a series of special meetings to teach on the spiritual gifts or on the types and shadows of the Old Testament. Still, there's no outreach to non-Christians. Singers entertain the Christians, followed by more polishing. The lost coin is still not sought. The lost sheep are still not gone after. Constant attention is given to those safe in the fold. Meanwhile, the unconverted continue to be untouched by Christians, unreached by soul winners. Christ cannot reach them because Christians do not go out after them. They will only see Christ and his love through us. He yearns to save them, but he can only do it through us. God never called anyone to a ministry that was not a soul-winning ministry. The very essence of being a Christian is to have Christ living in you, witnessing and ministering through you. 
The early church lived with this passion for souls. They were Christ-like. Whatever your talent in the church, you're first of all a soul winner, first of all a witness, then a writer, a teacher, a pastor, a prophet, or whatever God has specifically gifted you for. You can be a soul winner, a real Christian, because Jesus was. Dr. Osborne's next message deals with the second of seven reasons why he and his associate minister and wife, Dr. Daisy Osborne, are worldwide soul winners. This message number five is titled, Out Where the People Are. And now, here's Mr. Osborne. Daisy and I are soul winners because the harvest is so great. No one can look into the faces of the masses, bewildered by superstitious religions as we've done, without doing their utmost to win souls. For over three decades, we've stood on crude platforms out in open fields before multitudes of underprivileged people, interspersed with lepers, demoniacs, witch doctors, and the hopelessly diseased. We've preached Christ to them when it was all we could do to hold back tears of human emotions. Worldwide, there are millions who've not yet been reached. They constitute the vast, ripened harvest of souls waiting to be reaped. This is the second reason why we are soul winners, because the harvest is so great. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In verse 37, as he pondered these needy multitudes, he said, The harvest truly is plenteous. Well, what did he do about it? He called twelve disciples, gave them power to cast out devils and to heal the sick, and then he sent them out to help reap this harvest. Later, he called seventy more. Then, before his ascension, he conferred upon all, all believers the power to witness with miracles in his name. The fact is this, he did something about this ripened harvest. He didn't just sit and ponder it and pray about it. He set about getting laborers out into these harvest fields. Since Christ was moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes, and since we are like Christ, we also can be moved with compassion for or toward those who are untouched by the gospel. If we are, then, like Christ, we become involved doing something about sharing the gospel with them. A pastor or a Christian may say, Oh, yes, we have compassion for the lost. We hold special prayer meetings each week interceding for sinners to be saved. We're praying faithfully that people will be drawn into our church and be converted. We're having extra meetings and a special speaker to preach to the unconverted. Did Christ tell us to go to church and ring a bell to engage a special speaker and pray for sinners to come to our church to be saved? Or did he say, like Luke chapter 14, verse 23, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled? When we think of soul winning, there's a principle to remember. Non-Christians do not go to church. We cannot reach them inside the church building. To communicate the gospel to them, we simply must go outside the church, out where they live, out where they work, out where they play. Certainly a few can be reached in church meetings, but the rank and file of the unconverted multitudes will never go to church. They'll never be contacted inside the church sanctuary. They may never meet Christ or know his love unless they see him or hear of him through us, witnessing and sharing him out where the people are. This truth cannot be overemphasized. We are Christ's body. He can only reach people through us. The church must go to them. That's what Christ told his followers to do. That's what the early church believers did in busy marketplaces, on street corners, at village wells, by the seaside, in the homes. These early Christians occupied themselves witnessing and winning souls. It was just terrific. The Principle of Evangelism 
It was never God's plan that evangelism or soul winning be carried on inside the church building. Evangelism can only be effective out where the people are. The church building is the place where God's people come together to be nourished in God's word of faith, taught in the doctrines of Christ, strengthened as Christians, and taught how to witness. But soul winning is done out where the people live and work and play. The early church stayed busy, according to Acts 5, 42. Daily they were in the temple and in every house. They never stopped preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. It's vital that we re-emphasize this basic principle in soul winning. We don't go fishing in the bathtub. If we expect to catch fish, we cast our net away from our house, out in the stream, in the lakes, and the waterways of the wilderness, out where the fish are. It's as simple as that, isn't it? We never harvest a crop inside our dining room. To reap the ripened grain, we wield our sickle through the heat of the day, away from the house, out in the broad fields, out where the grain stands ripe and ready to be harvested. We don't win souls by staying inside our church buildings. To reap the unconverted, we carry our witness away from our sanctuaries, out into the markets, onto the streets, in jails, hospitals, houses of prostitution, in the homes of people, out among them, out where they live and work and play. This is evangelism. We've dedicated over three decades of our lives to reaching people out where they are. This is why we build our platforms out in parks, on racetracks, or stadium grounds, or out on fields. Hindus don't go into a church. Muslims will never enter a Christian temple. Shintoists and Buddhists don't attend Christian worship. The unchurched don't go to church. But when we go out with the gospel to public places, to seasides, parks, stadiums, racetracks, or open fields, the unconverted come by the tens of thousands, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, non-Christians. We're out where they live and work and play. After we've won them out where they are and they've been converted, then they'll come into the house of God to learn more of the word of God and to learn more of the Christian faith. The method of the early church was to go out where the people are. This is where Peter and John shared their testimony when the crippled man was healed, out on the streets. This is where Peter's great mass meetings were held in Jerusalem, out in the streets and in the busy roadways. This is where Philip preached to all of Samaria, out in the public. This is where he found the eunuch and led him to Christ, out on the trader's roadway. This is where Paul convinced the heathen, out on the island, among the people. A farmer reaps out in the field. Being raised on a farm as one of 13 children, I know what a ripened harvest looks like. I know the urgency of the harvest. When the broad fields of grain become ripe, we toiled relentlessly from early until late, reaping the harvest out where it grew. Then we would go to the house where a wonderful meal was prepared to nourish our weary bodies. And after we'd eaten, we went back to the fields to continue reaping again till nightfall. We toiled day after day until the farthest corners of the vast fields were harvested. Too often Christians are not taught to do this. If a program of soul-winning evangelism is attempted, it usually consists of special prayer meetings for people to be drawn into the church to be converted. Then a visiting teacher addresses the spiritual needs of the unconverted for a few nights. But if they're not there, how can they be helped? This idea is all right for the few who may attend or who have been won this way. However, we cannot think of reaching the world this way. The ripened masses of the unconverted cannot be harvested inside our churches because the vast majority of them will never come into our churches. If we really want to reap the harvest of our generation, the secret is to rediscover the passion and zeal of the early church. Those early Christians went out across cities and villages in constant pursuit of lost souls, even at the risk of their lives. This is Christianity in action, being Christ-like. As children on the farm, suppose we had eaten to our full. Then, with our bodies strengthened and nourished, suppose we looked out the windows and pondered the ripened grain. 
Suppose ominous storm clouds were gathering and the rumble of thunder was increasing, and what if we'd knelt for a long afternoon of prayer, asking God to reap the harvest and to save the grain? Suppose we had earnestly prayed, Oh God, save this grain. Just send it our way so that we can reap it right here in our dining room. Wouldn't that sound rather ridiculous? Yet, this is what many congregations have done. Too often, they're not outside the church reaping the soul harvest of this generation. Instead, they're praying, Oh God, save lost souls. Just draw them into our beautiful church so that we can get them saved right here where we are. It seems as though they are saying, Lord, how can we risk our reputation among unsaintly people? We dare not be witnessing to prostitutes, homosexuals, narcotic and alcohol dependents out there in hell's half acre where our reputation and the honor of our members might be at stake. We seem to be saying, Oh Lord, you've given us this holy sanctuary where our reputation is protected. If you'll just send those dirty, unconverted people to us, we'll pray for them in our sanctified environment, and we'll help them to be clean like we are. Convenience or compassion? Well, my friend, we have our lovely churches, our beautiful choirs, our comfortable pews. Yes, we're well equipped. But is it fair to expect the unconverted to have to come to us to be saved? Would we not reach more of them by going out where they are and giving them our message there, loving them where they are? Many Christians pray for the salvation of the unconverted, but they never do anything about going out with Christ's love and giving them his message out where they are. Yet, they call this compassion for the lost. For hundreds of years, this philosophy has proven ineffective. I wonder if people cling to such ideas because they've not been taught otherwise. In the early church, every believer was a witness, a soul winner. Today, thousands of church members have never been encouraged to lead a soul to Christ. The idea never occurred to them. Most of them would not know the first step to take in actually leading an unbeliever to Christ on the spot. The early church method, God's idea, was for every believer to be a witness, a soul winner, then to go out in the highways and hedges and compel people to come in so that his house would be filled. We're to win people out where they are. Then they'll come to the house of God to be nourished in faith by the pastor and by the teachers. Why? For one reason. So that they may return to the ripened fields and join the reapers in saving other souls. What a church can do. I recommend to you, whether you're a pastor, a teacher, or a church worker, that you determine not only to learn to win souls yourself, but to share with and inspire other Christians around you to do the same. New steps can be taken at once to plant ideas among those who are under your influence. Think of every possible idea to motivate Christian friends and acquaintances to get out where people are to share Christ. For example, get extra copies of our book called Soul Winning and of its sequel, the companion book, Join This Chariot. Then make an investment in the lives of other Christians by giving them copies to inspire them. You can motivate people to success happiness, and greater self-esteem by encouraging them to reach out and to lift others this way. Many years ago, we decided to do something to encourage Christians worldwide to inspire this kind of Christian witnessing out where the people are, out where they live and work and play. Do you know what we did? We sent over 100,000 gift copies of our book, Soul Winning, and its companion book to special ministers, pastors, evangelists, missionaries, national church leaders around the world. We did it as an investment in the ministry of other believers all over the world. Now, as we observe the effect of that investment, we can see that those two books have proven to be the seeds from which a revival of soul winning out where the people are has literally spread throughout the free world. There are so many workable, effective ideas for reaching people and for sharing Christ with them.
Buy two or three small tents, or rent a small hall, or a shop, or a room. Then invite a few Christian friends to operate in each location of your area. Equip them with literature and other tools, videos, or films, or cassettes, or tapes, and literature. Invest in ten portable audio or video cassette players. There's an idea for you. Then invite ten qualified Christians to take those ten audio or video cassette machines equipped with recorded sermons, music, and good gospel literature, and witness in streets, homes, play areas, bars, beaches, and businesses of ten different sections of your town. Wouldn't that be terrific? The ten towns called the Decapolis. There was a naked demoniac Running in the tombs, he would cut his flesh with stones. Jesus found him, and Jesus cast the demons out of him, and the poor man believed on Christ. And as soon as he believed on Christ, Jesus and his disciples clothed him. And do you know what Jesus did? He sent him out to witness to the ten towns called the Decapolis. You can read that in Mark chapter 5, verses 19 to 20. And it says in the Living Bible, the man began to tell everyone about the great things Jesus had done for him. He was just a new convert, but what a powerful witness he was for Jesus Christ. The Lord may have ten supermarkets for you to reach, or ten convalescent homes, ten blocks, ten counties, ten villages, or ten communities, or ten houses. For Daisy and me, it's been nearly 70 nations. Think of it. So get your idea. Dream your dream. Stock up with the equipment and go for it. Stamp your church name on each track or book and encourage each worker to go out where the people are to win them. Inspire them to witness, to pray for the sick, and to lead souls to Christ on the spot right there where they are. During the day, they can canvass each area, leading many to Christ right in their own homes. Then at night, they can preach or teach or use their audio or video cassettes or films and win souls in their public meetings. Then on Sundays, these Christian workers can bring their newly won families into their own church. There the pastor can nourish them in God's word and train them until they too become soul winners out in their own areas. Some Christians will want to go to jails, others to hospitals with headsets on their cassette players so they'll not disturb other patients. Others will go to convalescent homes, others to special areas. Youth groups supplied with cassettes and books and tracks and musical instruments can witness on street corners, in residential areas, in shopping centers, in marketplaces, wherever there are people, out where the people live and work and play. Christ can only show his love to people through Christians. Remember that each believer is Christ's body today and that Jesus can only reach the lost through a believer. A whole new vision will soon grip your Christian friends. They'll gain a fresh passion for souls, a zeal for soul winning. Paint a large banner and hang it inside your church or classroom so that everybody can see it. Say this, our motto, every Christian a witness. Or paint another one and say this, our mission, out where the people are. Doesn't that sound inspiring? Banners are effective. When we attended Dr. Oswald J. Smith's evangelism convention many years ago, the very atmosphere was alive with banners. Just sitting and reading them inspired us. It's an old technique, but it always works. Did you ever notice how demonstrators carry banners in their parades? All week long engage in a busy program of soul winning. On Sundays and some midweek evenings, let the soul winners gather at the house of God to be nourished and inspired by the word. But then let them return in their new strength to harvest again out where the people are. This is the vision of the happy believer. This gives excitement to Christian living. This makes Christian living truly objective. This eliminates depression and loneliness. This adds enthusiasm to your church. This is evangelism as it was practiced by the early church. Mushrooming all around us in every city and country is a generation unreached by the gospel. Religious in many ways, 
but unaware of the reality of Jesus Christ. This is the ripened harvest, our harvest field. Christ can only reap that harvest through us. We are his body today. Daisy, my wife and I, have already invested over three decades in reaping this harvest. This is what has inspired us to reach almost 70 nations of the world already. Literally millions have believed on Christ. And that's why I say this is the second reason we are soul winners. The harvest truly is great. Dr. Osborne is ready now to share the third of seven major reasons why he and Daisy are soul winners at home and abroad. Here is his message number six entitled, Here Am I. Daisy and I are soul winners because the laborers are so few. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 says this, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. World population is increasing at the rate of over 70 million per year. Did you know that less than 3 million of that increase is being touched by the gospel? It's a fair estimate that there are perhaps 2 billion souls who have never heard a gospel witness. This represents nearly half of the world's population, including tribes people who speak over a thousand different languages. A lost world is racing toward eternity at a terrifying speed. In Japan, for example, after over 400 years of gospel ministry, the overwhelming majority of the hundred million people are still non-Christian. Most of Japan's 95,000 rural communities have no Christian witness. Yet, there's a tremendous response to the gospel wherever the opportunity exists to hear it, especially among Japan's youth. Those engaged in literature, radio, and TV evangelism receive over half of all responses from the 15 to 25 year age group. Young Japan is ripe for harvesting, but where are the laborers? About one out of three people today live in China where the gospel has been so limited. Almost two million people commit suicide annually. Thirty times more souls are born than converts are made. On an average, Muslims send 4,000 teachers south of the Sahara Desert into Africa each year. Think of it. They've been converting the Africans to Islam at a much faster rate than the Christians have been winning them to Christ. Scientific materialism and atheism are everywhere. They're opposing the Christian message. The golden opportunity for Christians is to reap this vast human harvest with renewed enthusiasm and dedication. Looking on the Fields in John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus said, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Again, he said in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We've looked and we've seen the harvest fields of the world. Daisy and I have prayed for more laborers. But above all, we're giving our lives, reaping this harvest. That's why we're soul winners, because the laborers are so few. In India alone, there is a district of 77 villages where a recent census showed that there's not one Christian among them. No national pastor, no missionary, no evangelist has ever preached the gospel there. Those people live and die without Christ, not because they've rejected him, but because during the last 2,000 years not one Christian has gone to share with them the gospel of his love. Yes, Jesus said it right. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. While 94% of all ministers of the gospel in the world are preaching in comparative comfort to the 9% of English-speaking people, a lonely 6% of them are struggling to meet the spiritual needs of the remaining 91% of the world. 
Put in another way, 94% of the preachers are preaching to the English-speaking people of the world. That's a total of 9% of the world. Of the remaining 91% of the world's population, they only have 6% of the ministers of the gospel witnessing to them. That isn't fair, is it? Daisy and I have chosen to give the best of our lives to sharing Christ where the need is greatest and where the workers are fewest. That's why we've taken every possible step to multiply our lives by producing and providing tools for evangelism for the church of this century around the world, by recording our voices on magnetic tape, video cassettes, and film with the help of anointed national interpreters, we can reach hundreds of tribes simultaneously, regardless of the many different dialects they may speak. When a national Christian, perhaps one who's not yet been trained to preach well, when he switches on a good cassette unit, another proficient soul winner is in the making. After a few weeks, our message is so absorbed by that worker and our manner of evangelism is so becoming a part of them that they can switch off the unit and there another worker has been born. The unit can then be given to another untrained worker and the process is repeated. In the meantime, another preacher is out proclaiming the same gospel messages. This is proving effective worldwide. Each time a documentary crusade film is shown to crowds of thousands in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Africa, or in any other nation, this again is multiplying another soul-winning operation, and it works at home as well as abroad. Every time a gospel track is passed from hand to hand, the message of life is being reproduced. You too can increase your gospel witness with literature by sending more gospel witnessing tools to the mission fields of this generation and by putting more evangelism tools to work on the home front too. Why are we soul winners? Because the laborers are so few. Message number seven. It reveals the fourth vital reason for soul winning and is titled, The Choice to Win. Daisy and I are soul winners because of the Great Commission. The last thing Jesus authorized us to do before he went away was, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. This is his authority to each of his followers. This is the greatest opportunity he ever offered to you and me. This is every Christian's privilege, calling, purpose, and ministry. When God's love overflowed to the point that he gave his only begotten son, it was for the whole world, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life, whoever believes. Christ left us no privilege greater than to announce the gospel to every creature. This is the believer's guarantee of happiness. This is what the early Christians did day and night. They witnessed from house to house, at markets, village wells, on the busy roadways, on the streets, in meeting places, from jail cells, in dungeons, everywhere. They understood their calling. They did as Jesus did. They knew he was living in them, doing through them the same things he had done before he was crucified. This is why they were called Christians. Many churches don't encourage this concept. Most Christians are church members, but few are witnesses. They go to their sanctuaries, but not to the byways to tell people of Christ. There's a vital principle to be remembered. Non-Christians do not usually go to church buildings. Therefore, we can never reach them inside the church buildings. We must go out after them, out where they are, as Jesus authorized us to do. He is in us. We're his body. He can only reach people through us. Perhaps no couple in this generation has followed such a basic pattern of evangelism for so long a time as Daisy, my wife, and I have. We've already dedicated over three decades of our lives giving the simple gospel of Christ to people out in public places. If you had walked on the grounds of our earliest campaigns, then attended a recent crusade, you would have heard the same gospel, 
presented with the same simplicity, you would observe the same strategy, heard the same prayers, and seen the same miracles. The Great Commission of Christ is the reason behind this ministry and its entire design. Our motto is one way, one job. The one way is Jesus. The one job is evangelism. Every phase of each operation of our ministry is aimed at reaching the unconverted, the unchurched with the gospel, reaching them out where they are. As Christians, that's been our choice. Christ lives in us. We're his body. We want him to win souls through us. Only one purpose. We live and breathe for one purpose, to share the gospel with the maximum number of people by every means possible. We use not only our own voices as Christ speaks through us, but also channels of mass media, reproduction, duplication, and every form of dissemination we can utilize. Our world ministry as it's known today was not planned by us. No such design entered our minds at its beginning. What happened? We simply chose to obey Christ's great commission. We accepted it as our life's work. We chose to invest ourselves completely, sharing the gospel with every person whom we could reach. We've conducted almost a steady stream of public gospel crusades, preaching face-to-face -to, -face to literally millions of people all over the world in 70 different nations. But this was not enough. These meetings, these great crusades only lasted two or three hours each day. What about the other hours of each day? It dawned on us that we could write the same message that we had preached. Giant presses could turn them out by the millions, by the tons, in every written language on earth. This way, we could reach hundreds of millions of extra souls who would never hear the sound of our voices. For years, we've averaged publishing over a ton of gospel tracts every working day. Not counting the additional tons of our books and magazines pouring monthly into the nations of the world. This literature has been rolling off the world's presses in 132 different languages. Think of that. With the world's masses becoming literate at the rate of 3 million per week, over 150 million per year, and with their insatiable thirst for reading material, the printing of faith literature opens the door for us to reach every literate person with the gospel message. And that opportunity is open to you too. How terrific our lives can be. In addition to our crusades and literature ministry, we could still do more, we decided. What about the illiterate millions? Most of the underprivileged masses of the world cannot read or write. What could we do about them? To reach these illiterate masses, these illiterate millions, we've utilized the remarkable sound devices of this century, the audio and the videotape and the motion film. What fantastic possibilities exist here for both personal evangelism as well as TV and radio outreaches to the unchurched. So we began to preach on film and on tape the same good news that we had proclaimed to the millions in our audiences. And we began to create tools for soul winners as well for mass media release. Soon the wheels of two additional outreaches were rolling. Our sound production team began duplicating these anointed crusade sermons in sight and in sound in scores of languages with more being added at every opportunity to this day. Today, tens of thousands of audio and video cassettes, as well as documentary crusade films in over 60 languages, are operating in the hands of national church leaders, evangelists, pastors, and gospel ministers in nations worldwide, and on the Christian home fronts too, attracting millions of extra people to hear the gospel. Terrific outreaches, terrific ideas, terrific productivity, terrific harvests are being reaped. One pastor alone showed one of our films 20 times in one province. He said that he reached over 50,000 souls and witnessed more than 8,000 
thousand decisions for Christ during those 20 film showings. Another minister reported 2,000 decisions in only eight days of film ministry. Can you imagine that? And these figures are multiplied into almost infinity as these tools are released via mass media. Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. We've pondered the millions of tribes people living far beyond the fringes of civilization, out of the range of missionaries or national church leaders, without the luxury of TV or radio. These also must hear the gospel. There are over 2,000 tribes like this who do not comprehend the languages used for mass media. We prayed for ways to reach them too. To this end, our National Evangelism World Outreach Program was born. God showed us how we could inspire Christians in the more prosperous nations of the world to share a certain amount of money each month to personally sponsor a national preacher as a missionary to those tribes. We alerted soul-winning missions around the world with this vision, and as they began to recruit qualified national Christians who would risk their lives to go to the interior of these neglected areas, we began to recruit Christian sponsors. The delicate balance of demand and supply has been a constant miracle since this program of national evangelism was inaugurated. Many thousands of national missionaries have been sponsored in over a hundred nations, reaching innumerable unreached tribes and areas with the gospel. Did you know that an average of over one new church per day has been opened and has become self-supporting? That is almost 400 new churches per year for many, many years. Never in church history had such a far-reaching evangelism effort been affected. God increased our best. As a lad with a toy press, printing scripture verses on scraps of paper, I did my best. Then God increased that best. Each year, greater ideas and greater capacities developed as we kept reaching out for better methods and concepts to win more souls. We're doing our utmost to share the gospel. We constantly apply every talent possible and grasp every available opportunity and method to evangelize. Because of this, there's developed this enormous ministry of world evangelism with its globe-circling influence. It's been like planting good seeds. They always grow, and harvests continue to increase. Our persistent goal has been to reach non-Christians, the unchurched, the unevangelized, not the already Christian populace. Many ask, why don't you conduct your campaigns in churches? Simply because non-Christians do not go to the churches to reach them, we go to them. We go out where they are. Jesus said, preach to every creature. If one nation is 95% Christian, while another is 95% non-Christian, our choice has always been and is to reach the non-Christian nation. If a small field of ripened grain had a hundred reapers at work in it, while a large field had only one reaper, which field would you toil in to save the grain? You'd choose the field where the need's greatest and where there are the fewest to meet the need. It's as simple as that. If ten people were lifting a log, nine on the small end and one on the large end and you wanted to help, it wouldn't be difficult for you to choose which end to lift on. Opportunities Worldwide you don't need a special call to be a soul winner. Your golden opportunity as a Christian is to let your light shine, to witness, to share the gospel with the unchurched. This is your finest purpose in life. This is why it's objective for any Christian who's a professional in any field to move to a gospel-neglected nation and operate a business or a profession where it can facilitate a ministry of witnessing and soul winning. Whether you're a mechanic, a pharmacist, an artist, a mason, a dentist, a photographer, a plumber, you may be a carpenter, an engineer, or capable of any other profession or skill, resituate yourself and your family in an unevangelized nation. Your profession will be desperately needed and heartily welcomed. While you practice your trade or profession or skill, you'll carry out a constant ministry of witnessing to non-Christians. You don't have to be an ordained minister to share the gospel. This is the privilege of every believer. 
These nations and tribes and areas can only learn of Christ and see his love and compassion as Christians live and witness among them. Christ can never reach them without a body, and we are his body. He can only be seen in us. His good news can only be heard through us. He can only speak through our lips. For too long, the great business opportunities overseas have been monopolized by unconverted people. Non-Christians with a zest for adventure rush through these open doors. They establish their businesses or agencies abroad, then revel in a non-Christian lifestyle among these people that sometimes a disgrace. Meanwhile, Christians with integrity and high moral standards remain at home, assuming that they must have a missionary call before they can go abroad and witness of Christ. They don't comprehend that they are Christ's body, that Christ can only reach these developing nations through human beings in whom he lives. They wait for the church to do the job, forgetting that they are the church. Christian professionals are the ones who should take advantage of these business and professional opportunities overseas. Their careers will yield fruitful, soul-winning ministries and will be instrumental in carrying out Christ's commission. Christians don't need a special call to do the things that Christ authorized to be done throughout the world. They only need to see the world as God sees it and to accept the honor of being one of his ambassadors of righteousness. Our master asks, Whom shall I send, or who will go for us? You can answer with Isaiah, Here am I, Lord. Send me, you bet. That's what I have said. That's what Daisy said. That's what you can say. Go and share the gospel with as many people as you can reach. The call has been given. The opportunities are plentiful. The need is urgent. Success is assured. You, as Christ's ambassador, are authorized to be involved. You need no further calling. As you begin to think about your world and inform yourself about conditions in various areas of the globe, you'll be guided by God's Spirit within you to where the opportunity is greatest and the need for Christian messengers is the most urgent. Paul, for example, was en route to Asia on a certain occasion when... The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 9, he was forbidden by the Holy Ghost. Then he tried going into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered him not. Then a vision appeared to Paul in the night. In this vision, a man of Macedonia prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. That's the kind of guidance you'll receive if you stay sensitive and alert in your spirit. Paul was already an apostle, an evangelist, going throughout the world, preaching the gospel. As he was going to yet other regions beyond, he received this guidance to Macedonia. This has happened to us numerous times. Once, we were determined to go to India. As we were on our way, we were impressed of the Lord to change our course to the southern tip of the Philippines. Our obedience resulted in a glorious mass crusade among those needy people. Often we're guided this way. Usually it happens when we're in action. Our constant understanding with the Lord is this. Lord, if there's any certain field or area or nation where you want us, show us and we'll go. But if you don't, we'll choose the best opportunity and reap the most fruitful harvest that we can. We'll be there reaping until you guide us somewhere else. Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 20, Lo, I am with you always. He's in us. We're his body. We go so that he can reach the people. He speaks and witnesses and ministers through us. He's concerned for the whole world. Our orders are already given. Go to all the world. Preach to every creature. That's our mission. Christ's words are to be acted upon, not analyzed or argued about or theorized. Our open doors. Our unconverted world is hurting. They have problems without answers, diseases without remedies, fears without faith, guilt without pardon. Christ's last words to his followers was his authorization to go help, heal, lift, and love them and to win them. 
The words of Christ afford us our golden opportunity, and they guarantee our success, our self-esteem, and our total happiness in life. As we lift people, we are lifted. Healing them, we are healed. Loving people, we are loved. In serving others, we're truly serving our Lord. When we stand before him, he will commend us. He will say in the words of Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40, I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then listen to this. Jesus says, Inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it unto me. These are our open doors. Jesus Christ died for the whole world. His blood was shed for the remission of the sins of every person on earth who will call upon him, according to Matthew chapter 26 and 28. And according to Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 17, but how can they call on him if they've not believed? And how can they believe on him if they've not heard? Good questions, aren't they? So Paul answers, he says, so then faith comes by hearing the word of God. You and I are the witnesses, the confessors, the testifiers, the voices, the preachers, the instruments through which this world can hear the gospel. Christ lives and ministers through us. This is the last thing Jesus authorized us to do. It constitutes our finest and most productive lifestyle. Daisy and I have chosen to share Christ with people. We are soul winners because of the great commission of Jesus Christ. Mr. Osborne is ready now to give you his eighth message in this audio book. He'll show you the fifth of seven basic reasons for sharing the good news of Christ with the world. T.L. and Daisy consider this to be among the most significant factors which has motivated them to a lifetime of successful witnessing. Here now is Dr. Osborne with his message number eight, The Forgotten Ones. Daisy and I are soul winners because of the unfulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus' return. It's almost become a tradition for teachers to emphasize the soon return of Christ by declaring, every prophecy has been fulfilled which precedes his second coming. But is this true? Perhaps the most important sign of all has not yet been fulfilled. That sign concerns you and me. It involves us as Christians and our ministry as witnesses. Jesus specified several signs of his coming, among them false Christs, wars, nations in conflict, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, persecutions, deceit, lack of consecration, and other things. You can read about them in Matthew chapter 24 from verses 4 through 12. Then he added something that concerns you and me. He said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You see, that's the ministry he entrusted us with. Christ's last words before he returned to the Father were, in essence, go now to all nations and proclaim to every creature the good news, and as soon as you do this, I shall return. Has this been done yet? I can imagine impetuous Peter nudging John, saying, Come on, John, let's hurry. This won't take long. Then he'll come back for us. The early church understood their mission. Not only the apostles, but each believer was a witness. Day by day, in houses, on streets, at village wells and markets, on roadways, they shared Christ and won souls. Their objective was to reach every creature, and all nations as rapidly as possible in spite of deadly opposition because as soon as they finished, Jesus Christ would return. They knew that Christ was not dead but lived in them doing the same things he did before he was crucified. They understood that Christ could only speak and witness through them. This concept of soul winning so motivated the early Christians that they spread the gospel testimony across most of their then-known world. 
down across the Mediterranean. The message went until one time North Africa was dotted with Christian places of worship. Can you imagine it? Braving storms, dangers at sea, perils of ancient travel, and every conceivable hardship, they spread the message with unequaled gallantry. Then instead of charting camel caravans south of the Sahara into the African jungles or pressing eastward beyond the continental mountain barriers or northward to the pagan tribes, they became more interested in conserving what they had. They failed to press on to the uttermost parts of the world. Conventions began to replace evangelism. Doctrinal disputes superseded personal witnessing. Soon the church began to lose power, and she finally sank into the dark ages. The decline came when Christians lost the basic concept of Christ in you. They no longer considered themselves individually as Christ's body and as his voice. They created religious organizations calling those entities the church. Darkness prevailed and Christ was not shared with unbelievers. It was hundreds of years later when Martin Luther perceived that the just shall live by faith, and the Reformation began. The church began her slow rediscovery of early church evangelism. The Wesleys, preaching sanctification, followed by the 20th century revival of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, were further steps in the slow revival of effective Christianity. From God's viewpoint, these truths were unveiled afresh so that Christians might be empowered to witness in all the world, among all nations, to every creature, and thus bring back the King. They left the forgotten ones. But the church did not hold God's viewpoint. Tradition concerning Christ's return blinded them to the purpose of Pentecost. Rather than witnessing with power to the unsaved in houses, on streets, in markets, out where the people are, they segregated themselves with innumerable sectarian barriers and denominational labels. They left the forgotten ones to their own pitiful fate while they withdrew into religious communities, councils, and clubs. They ignored the cry of the unreached, defending their doctrines, proselyting members, and placating themselves with their own religious ceremonies. As a whole, church members have not skilled themselves in going out where the unconverted world lives. We can never witness to the world to the masses of unchurched multitudes from within our church sanctuaries. Non-Christians do not go to church. The church was commissioned to go to the people. In the words of Jesus, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Go out into the highways and the hedges. Go into all the world. Go to every creature. Jesus told us to go out where the people are and to win them exactly as he did, not in religious sanctuaries, but out where they live and work and play. Has this been done? Has this gospel been preached as a witness unto all nations, as Christ said shall be done prior to his return? Over one half of our generation is unreached by the gospel. They've never heard the good news even once. They are the forgotten ones of our time. Why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone has heard it once? Over a thousand tribes have never had a gospel witness. Reaching these people is therefore the sign which Christ foretold, but which has not yet been fulfilled. This is the sign which concerns you and me. We are authorized to reach the unreached with the gospel of Christ. This is why we're doing everything we can do to win souls and to encourage every other Christian to be a soul winner. This is why we've developed a whole arsenal of tools for evangelism. With these, we equip soul winners around the world to increase their soul harvest as they go out in search of these forgotten ones. These were Christ's last words to us. This was the only thing he left us to do. Has the church accomplished this yet? Learn from the revolutionaries. 
What an object lesson political revolutionaries are for Christians. Did you ever think about it? They invade and infiltrate developing nations. Their leaders retreat to the hills, the jungles, the swamps, and from there impose control on local tribes. Once entrenched among these forgotten people, where disease and poverty are rampant, they organize guerrilla bands and begin their hit-and-run harassment. First villages, then towns and cities, and their aim is always a national takeover. These political and mercenary leaders go to the very people which the church has often neglected. They pay any price and make any sacrifice to live in the most difficult areas. The modern gospel messenger has not been equipped or encouraged to reach these people. In general, they would scarcely survive in such areas, so these tribes have been left without Christ. Whereas the insurgents send in their teachers to live completely indigenous and make the utmost sacrifice, life itself, to organize these tribes into forces for their purpose. What the church has not done, revolutionaries have done. The very people who have been neglected by the church have become a hotbed for enemy seed sowing. What an example they are to the Christian church. Insurrectionists go where the church has not gone and mobilize the people for their harassment teams and take over entire nations. Yet Christian teachers take the position, all signs are fulfilled, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Can this be the attitude of a real, living, vibrant Christian who cares? Our privilege as Christians has not been withdrawn since Christ gave his commission. First, we are to give the gospel to every nation. Then, the end shall come. This is why Daisy and I are soul winners, because this prophecy is still unfulfilled. It concerns us. It concerns you. Christ died for every creature, but he can only reach them through us. We are his body. This is why most of our public ministry has been among the unchurched masses of nations abroad. They are the unreached they do not come to church. We go out after them, out where they are, so that Christ can speak to them through us. We reach them to the limit of our possibilities. Naturally, it would be more convenient, and we would prefer living our lives surrounded with the comforts of home. However, our opportunity as Christians is to witness to the maximum number of souls by every available means. This is what we've done and what we continue doing. Our unfinished task. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13 verse 10, the gospel must first be published among all nations. There are over 3,000 languages spoken and over a third of them do not yet have a single gospel portion published in them. Has the church done what Christ said must be done first? This is why for many years we've published faith books and salvation tracts by the tons in over a hundred languages. We choose to do our utmost to reach these forgotten ones. As long as our evangelism partners share with us, we shall continue publishing the gospel in more and more dialects. Sometimes it's argued that every nation has had the gospel at one time or another. Evidently, our Lord knew such voices would be raised. In the Revelation, he showed the Apostle John things to come. John's words are vital for the soul winner. He writes, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, listen to this, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. That's in Revelations chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Obviously, this is the multitude of the redeemed, gathered to worship before God's throne. And it will be like John said. Among this multitude were those from all nations, it mentions nations first. Some say, I'm sure that all nations have now heard the gospel. Yes, perhaps. But the vision was more specific than that. The Holy Spirit went on to detail 
all kindreds and peoples and tongues. If Christ returned today, this scene could not be as John saw it. To be included in that multitude, they must hear the gospel, believe it, and be redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. In Revelations chapter 14, verse 6, John said, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. That's very specific, isn't it? Paul asks this question in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear Christ's gospel if he cannot speak through us? We're his body today, his lips, his voice. We're to go and let Christ speak through us to the people. This is the way they can hear and believe. Over a thousand peoples have not heard the gospel, not even once. Christ has not been able to reach them because Christians have not gone to them, and he will not send angels to do what he wills to do through you and me. Over a third of the tongues of the world have not yet had the gospel published in them. If Christ came today, could those hundreds of kindreds be there to cry, Salvation to our God and to the Lamb? This prophecy is not fulfilled yet. God's number one job. This is why we've sponsored so many thousands of national sons and daughters of the soil, national gospel ministers who've been enabled with our assistance to go and live among these unreached areas and tribes and to preach the gospel to them. This is soul winning. This is evangelism, what Christ authorized us to do. This is ministering life among the forgotten ones. We talk of Christ's second coming. Millions have never heard of his first coming. We insist on second blessings, while these forgotten ones have never tasted of a first blessing. We argue about a refilling, while multitudes have never experienced a first filling. Is this fair? Should those on the front row receive a second serving before the hungry ones on the back rows have received a first serving? We've dedicated this ministry to the back rows, to the unchurched, to the unsaved, to those forgotten ones. Is not this the Christian's greatest mission in life? Is this not a guarantee of success, of happiness, and of fulfillment? Once these forgotten ones are remembered as they should be, those prophecies will be fulfilled and Christ will return for his church. That's why we're soul winners, to bring back the king. Dr. T.L. Osborne will continue this recording of his special audio book, Soul Winning, on set number three of this series.